Um, so welcome uh, and a really warm welcome from Lawyers Against Poverty. This is the first in-person event that we've been able to host as a new organisation and since the pandemic. So it's very exciting for us and it's really great to see you all here in the room. My name is Emma Luff. I'm the director of the charity um, and it's wonderful to see our trustees and our members um, and hopefully some new members here this evening. I'll introduce this evening's speakers shortly, um, but firstly, I wanted to offer a huge thank you to Latham and Watkins, uh, and particularly JP and the events and the tech team who've been really instrumental in helping to organize this evening's event. Um, as many of you know, Lawyers Against Poverty is a movement of lawyers committed to pooling their individual resources to fight the injustice of poverty collectively. We were set up initially in 2015 as an Oxfam initiative, and since then, we've gone from strength to strength, growing as a network, supporting projects through our justice fund and volunteering to help people who are excluded by the legal system. There are some flyers on your seat that can tell you more about how you can get involved through Lawyers Against Poverty. And I hope that lots of you will get involved through Lawyers Against Poverty. And I'd also like to take this moment to thank those of you here who are already very involved and offer your time as partners, as collaborators and as volunteers to the cause. Um, so as we look into 2023, we have ambitions to do a lot more, and I hope that you will join us on that journey. Um, but without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for this evening. Philippe Sands really needs no introduction. As, a well, uh, as well as being a lawyer at the forefront of his field, he's a professor at the University College London and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He's also author of a number of books, including Lawless World, Torture Team, and East West Street on the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide. Philippe joins us this evening to share the story of his latest publication, The Last Colony, a tale of exile, justice, and Britain's colonial legacy. But I'll leave it to Philippe to tell us more about what that story illuminates. And we're also delighted to welcome Nick Flynn, legal director of Avaz, to share some clo closing comments on the role of lawyers in social justice causing. Avaz is a global movement bringing people-powered politics into decision-making processes. And I know that Nick has thought-provoking questions for lawyers about their role in tackling global crises. But before that, I'd briefly like to welcome JP Sweeney, who, as I mentioned, has been instrumental in making this evening happen. And also Joss Saunders, who I know will be familiar to many of you. He's also one of our diligent trustees and co-founder of Lawyers Against Poverty to talk about why he established the movement and why it matters. Um, but for now, lovely to see all of you. And JP, thank you and welcome. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I don't have a speech, just to say welcome, echo Emma's welcome on behalf of, of Latham. Uh, great to have everyone here. Um, I've been a member of uh, LAP for uh, longer than I can remember, but um, uh, <clears throat> these kind of events just make me feel guilty because I realise uh, I'm not giving enough of my time to the, the cause. But um, if sending a couple of emails on behalf of Emma has uh, you know, helped make this event possible, then yeah, delighted to have played that small part. Um, but yeah, great to see everyone and uh, welcome on behalf of the firm. Great, thanks very much, JP. Um, yeah, I was gonna tell you actually, as Emma said, about the beginning of LAP and how we came to found it. And um, in particular, I was gonna tell you about some amazing women lawyers from South Africa, from Central Asia and other places and how they inspired us to start. But then I read this article. Have any of you seen this article about Yevgeny Prigozhin, um, the head of Wagner, the mercenary company? and how he used, some might say gamed, I wouldn't say that at all, the English legal system and English lawyers. Uh, and although subject to sanctions, uh, then persuaded the Office for Sanctions to release funds so that he could use it to sue an investigative journalist um, for what Wagner Group was doing uh, in, uh, in Ukraine and other places. Um, and um, it made me realize that actually there is a problem that we need to solve. And I'm sure Nick is gonna come back to this later. 
Um, at the same time as the leader of the Russian mercenary group is getting a license from the British government to sue a journalist for saying what he's doing, humanitarian organizations, civil society organizations working in war zones and in conflict situations are not able to operate because of the very same rules which he has managed to resolve in his favor. And they're not able to resolve those because the playing field is not level. And when JP and I first started talking about this, we used a photograph of a football pitch. The thing about the football pitch is it was on a hill and the rich team plays at the top of the hill and the poor team plays at the bottom of the hill. It's not a level playing field. So um, Lawyers Against Poverty is about how you can level that playing field, turn the field around, turn the way that law works around, turn the way in which we use law around so that it is a level playing field. Remember that quote from Balzac who actually copied it off a, a Greek philosopher, which is law is like a spider's web. The rich go through and the small people, the poor get caught in the spider's web. So Lawyers Against Poverty is about how lawyers can get involved to level the playing field. It doesn't matter whether you're a student or a practitioner, whether you're in work or not in work, whether you're early in your career or whether you're retired, the idea is that every person who identifies as a lawyer who's going through or has gone through a legal training, has got that expertise, that experience, whether a qualified lawyer or not, and there are plenty of lawyers against poverty who are not qualified lawyers, but are working in the business of law, how they can get involved. So let me mention the two women who I said I would mention at the beginning before I hand over to, to Philippe to give us a, a, the main event, I'm the warm up act. Um, lawyers Against Poverty's twinning program was inspired by a young South African woman called Esther. I met Esther at a conference in Africa where we were talking about women's land rights and in particular, the problem of inheritance and that in many legal systems, women do not get a level playing field when it comes to inheritance. What can be done about it? And I said to Esther, what kind of help would you like? What support would you need? And I was thinking she, she might ask for books. She might ask for access to online resources. She might ask for a scholarship. You know what she said? Solidarity. Solidarity. I want to be connected with other lawyers in other places, other young women who are embarking on their careers, who've got children, who are trying to juggle their work-life balance. I want solidarity. So over here we have Pascal Bird, who's our twinning coordinator, and Pascal has led the work that Lawyers Against Poverty is doing to connect lawyers in different countries who want to meet together, not because we sitting in a lovely room, thank you very much, JP, in London, are going to be the people who are doing things to other people. It's not about mentoring where one person has the knowledge, the power, the authority, and is supervising or supporting somebody else. This is solidarity. This is mutual. This is an equal relationship, a sharing relationship where we, where we learn together. So that was Esther. And then the second inspiring woman, who some of you may remember from the early days of Lawyers Against Poverty, is a Tajik woman lawyer from Central Asia called Kanawat. Kanawat is the leader of the League of Women Lawyers in Tajikistan. She came to London to a conference on women's rights. And I was fortunate enough to meet her. And she said, come to Tajikistan. We don't get many visits. When I got there, I found out why. Um, but we, we, we went to the Human Rights Center. Philippe, I don't know if you've been to Dushanbe. We went to the Human Rights Center at the um, Russian Slavonic University, and we visited the Center for Human Rights. We also went to see the Minister of Justice, uh, who gave us a very interesting uh, spiel. In the Center for Human Rights, there were two portraits. This is, you know, who are the legal leading luminaries of human rights in Tajikistan at that time? One was the president of Tajikistan and the other was Vladimir Putin. 
<laughs> those, those were the two portraits. Uh, but we had a very interesting dialogue with the rector and a very, very good discussion. Then Kanawat took a group of us and there were seven Lawyers Against Poverty members. It was one of our first visits that we did and there's been other visits since. We took them to a, a southern part of Tajikistan to visit mobile clinics run by the League of Women Lawyers. And there are so many stories that we could tell you about that, but that uh, adventure, if you like, that story led us to create a women's rights group within Lawyers Against, uh, uh, Lawyers Against Poverty. And um, there are lots of people here who are on our board who can tell you about it. Um, we have my colleague Caroline and Dindi, Wave Caroline from Nairobi, who can tell you about Lawyers Against Poverty not just being a London focused thing. This is about other work. We've got the students in the twinning groups. We've got so many other people who, who you can talk to um, and uh, about the different programs, about the different people there. Could I just ask those of you who are board members to wave your arms so that other people can identify you? Okay, please do go, go and grab a board member afterwards. And then, Emma, is there anyone else you want to wave now to people talk to afterwards in terms of you, Emma? Yeah, great. All talk to each other. Fantastic. So that is why, through an indirect route, Lawyers Against Poverty, we are all, all can be, if we want to be, Lawyers Against Poverty. Now, I am totally delighted to hand over to Philippe. Philippe, uh, one of the reasons I'm totally delighted to hand over you is that I can sit down. But another is that I have so enjoyed reading East West Street, which was the one of the most favourite book, books in our book club. I heartily commend it to uh, all of you. And personally, it resonated with me because, and we may have a conversation about this one day, the whole approach and the history linking law and family resonates very strongly with my family from a, a similar part of the world, let's say, uh, which also resonates with work that we're doing now in Ukraine and Russia and Romania and Moldova and in Poland. Um, so absolutely delighted that, that you're here. Um, you're not going to be talking about lawyers against poverty. You are going to be talking about your book and the uh, incredibly important case, which has had such a big impact on human rights. And I look forward to seeing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you for the incredibly nice uh, introduction. It's really lovely to be here. And I just begin by saluting the work of lawyers against poverty. And I know a number of you who are involved with it and have done for many years, and I don't think there's anything that is more important um, than the work that you do as lawyers in that particular domain uh, and sector. So it's a great honour and happiness to give this lecture this evening, and I pass my thanks on to you for inviting me, and also uh, to Lothar and Watkins for providing the space, and all of you for coming. I, I suspect in part you've hinted at this. The invitation was prompted by the work that I do, as a barrister and academic on individuals and groups, on crimes against humanity and on genocide. It's a mix of sort of academic writings, litigation, books, podcasts, East West Street, The Rat Line, exploring Nuremberg, that revolutionary moment when for the first time in human history, a country's leaders were held to account before an international tribunal the idea that no country or person is ever above the law. It was a moment that heralded a new approach to international relations and to international law. And matters of justice are at the heart of much of what I do, including these books. A third is on the way with a distinctly Chilean flavor. And as you said, it's often for me about how the personal melds with the political and how individuals really can make a difference, including lawyers. This evening though, I want to tell another story, which I think fits very much into the work that you do. It's about responsibility and silence. It's about memory and identity, but it lies close to home. Although until recently, so few people in this country have known about the story. It's basically about rich people trashing poor people. It's about white people trashing black people. It's something that lies at the heart of modern Britain and that no one really wants to talk about. So it is for me emblematic 
In this country, it seems we are very easily distracted by the horrors that are perpetrated by others. And we don't really want to engage with our own past and talk about our own horrors, our continuing colonial racist instinct and our propensity to treat other human beings from around the world as somehow different and lesser. That's what I want to talk about. It's about a place called Chagos, an archipelago scattered across a vast swathe of the Indian Ocean. I've got to be clear, I am not independent in telling this story. I have been counsel for Mauritius for nearly 13 years in trying to bring justice uh, to this case. It is a small African country taking on the large powers. It's a case about a place that London still wants to call the British Indian Ocean Territory. And the British government's website still today jauntily describes it as an archipelago of 58 islands, 640,000 square kilometers, a British overseas territory administered from London, located, however, halfway between East Africa and Indonesia. Access to the area is totally restricted and banned, the website tells you, unless you happen to own a private yacht, in which case you are free to moor your vessel there provided you get a permit. The official website says nothing about Chagos's past. The fact that it was the last colony ever created by Britain, that today, it is Britain's last colony in Africa, that it is being illegally occupied, like Namibia was by South Africa for 25 years, that many years ago, its entire population of residents were forcibly deported, and they still to this day, those who are still alive and their descendants, want to be able to return. Britain just hangs on to its last colony, issuing colorful stamps with portraits of the queen and pretending that nothing has happened. To tell this story, it's best to start, I think, with the voice of the residents. That's what we did when we finally got to the International Court of Justice in September 2018 and presented witness testimony from a remarkable individual called Lisby Elise, who can neither read nor write, is 70 years old today, but was 20 years old when she was forcibly deported in April 1973, 50 years ago. The anniversary comes up in a couple of months. She described in her video, her testimony to the judges, she was present in court that day, how from one day to the next, she was told that she and everyone else would leave tomorrow. They would be allowed to take a single suitcase with them. She described to me how this occasion was the first time she had ever seen a white person. And this is what white people did to people like her. It was the single most significant moment I've ever experienced in 30 plus years of cases at the International Court of Justice. It had the most dramatic effect. I came to know Lisby Elise several years ago, and we have remained in very close contact. Her story resonated for me because it reminded me of other deportations, in particular of my two great grandmothers, of whom I wrote in East West Street, of course, never knew, who were transported from Vienna in July, 1942. Just like them, Lisby Elise was allowed a single suitcase. And after that hearing in The Hague five years ago, and I told her about how she, her story resonated with aspects of my grandfather's story, she looked at me and she just said, why has it taken us so long to get to the international court and to justice? And I couldn't really say very much beyond simple answer, which you'll be very familiar with with your own words. Justice is a long game. The origins of her story go back to before her birth. On Saturday, August the 9th, 1941, the USS Augusta was moored 
on Little Placentia Sound off the coast of Newfoundland, another British colony. On board, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill got into a bit of a quarrel about the future of the British Empire. The president wanted to end it, and he told the prime minister that both countries needed to work together to end Britain's backward colonial policy and support an idea that would soon come to be known as the right to self-determination, the right to decide your future for yourself. Words matter. The two men signed a document called the Atlantic Charter, which they described as their hopes for a better world. Churchill didn't realize that he'd been tricked by the American president. The document committed the two countries to respect the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they live. A document that reflected Roosevelt's hope that the colonized would soon have their own nation states. Churchill read the document somewhat differently, came back to London, not far from here, and told the House of Commons the words in the document were only intended for people who lived under the Nazi yoke. They weren't intended for Britain's colonies. That reading was not widely shared. In South Africa, a young man called Nelson Mandela noticed the Atlantic Charter in a newspaper, clipped it, and kept it for decades in his coat pocket. He recognized that the words would herald a new era of full citizenship and an end to discriminatory legislation. One thing led to another, as it often does in life. The ideas in the Atlantic Charter permeated into the United Nations Charter. And in the summer of 1945, decolonization became as Ralph Bunch, the lead American negotiator for the UN Charter put it, the hottest subject in town. Indeed, decolonization was stated as an aim of the UN Charter. Article one committed countries to the principle of self-determination, not yet the right. The language was limited as a sort of nod and a compromise to the French and the British who wanted to hold on to their possession. And so it began in the summer of 1945, the process that has come to be known as decolonization. For Britain, it started with India and a great deal of bloodshed, but it went on and on and on. Nevertheless, large parts of Africa remained under colonial rule as Britain and France held on to their distant possessions and subjects. One of those places where Britain held on was its colony called Mauritius. The British governor, Sir Hilary Rudolph Robert Blood, remained happily ensconced, as he put it, late in the 1950s in his pocket handkerchief paradise. In 1960, in Cape Town, Harold Macmillan evoked a wind of change. 16 African countries joined the UN that year. But as Macmillan spoke, a British diplomat wrote from the UK mission in New York back to London that decolonization was based on emotion, not on reason. It is, he wrote to the Foreign Office in London, a form of color prejudice in reverse. It reflected, in the words of this British diplomat, not a junior diplomat, resentment unjustified by, these are his words, the darker peoples against the past domination of the world by European nations. That was the view in 1960. It's uncomfortable, this story, okay? And I'm not gonna mince words. In the autumn of 1960, self-determination reached the UN General Assembly. On the 14th of December, 89 countries voted in favor of Resolution 1514. None voted against, nine abstained, mostly colonial powers, including Britain, which did not like the language of self-determination as a right. The resolution declared in terms, all peoples have the right to self-determination and it prohibited the partial or total disruption of the territorial integrity of any colony. Frederick Boland was the Irish diplomat who presided as the president of the General Assembly on the adoption of the resolution. And with his own background growing up in colonized Ireland, he warmly welcomed the adoption. 
he had personal experience of British colonial generosity. The assembly may well congratulate itself on this accomplishment, he declared as he brought the gavel down. With him in New York was his daughter, a young girl at the time, but who would become one of the world's most renowned poets alongside Seamus Heaney. Her name is Evan Boland, and she wrote a very famous poem called Witness. What is a colony, if not the brutal truth that when we speak, the graves open and the dead walk. The right to self-determination came into being and the people of Mauritius decided they wanted a bit of it. At the same time, however, the US was developing a new policy, one that placed military bases on distant atolls. Say a word about Mauritius. The Treaty of Paris, May 1814, ended the Napoleonic Wars, prohibited international trade in enslaved people, and ceded various French colonies to Britain. One of those was called Ile de France, known to the British as Mauritius. Ile de France had a number of dependencies, including the Chagos Archipelago, about 2,000 kilometers away, closer in fact to the Maldives, 58 islands and atolls, and a vast oceanic space. The islands included one you will have heard of, Diego Garcia, and far to the north, Perros Banos, where Lisbi Elise lived, two islands which produced copra and oil on plantations. By the early 1960s, as self-determination was written into international law, Chagos had about 2,000 2, inhabitants, most of whom worked for the Société Ruyère de Diego e Pet Perros. Almost all of them were black, and almost all were directly descended from the original enslaved inhabitants of the 17th and 18th century, many coming from Mozambique. Britain resisted giving Mauritius independence because it wanted something in return. Secretly, it had acceded to an American request to make the island of Diego Garcia available to it on a 70 year lease to be a communications facility the British decided they would empty the entire Chagos archipelago and remove all the inhabitants and give a single island to the Americans. We can do this, a Whitehall memorandum concluded, but we've got to be careful to avoid the charge that we are trafficking in colonial territory or that we are somehow disregarding the interests of the inhabitants or even worse, creating a new colony. Ever inventive, civil servants and lawyers the lawyers were key here in London, sought to circumvent international law and resolution 1514. We can detach Chagos from Mauritius, lawyers concluded, either by securing the consent of the Mauritians, or we can just simply present them with a fait accompli. Either way, it's got to be done as rapidly as possible, Harold Wilson concluded. The Mauritians opposed detachment invited to London to discuss independence. On September the 23rd, 1965, Harold Wilson met the Mauritian leader, Mr. Ram Gulam, at 10 Downing Street. He was given a briefing paper telling him how to deal with the Mauritians. The object, the paper wrote, is to frighten him with hope. Hope that he might get independence, fright less that he might not, unless he's sensible about the detachment of the Chagos archipelago. Diego Garcia can be detached unilaterally by order in council, Mr. Wilson told Mr. Rangulam, or you can give us your agreement. Under intense pressure, an understanding was reached. In return for detachment of Chagos, Mauritius would get its independence, a teeny bit of compensation, a few trade concessions, and even fewer fishing rights around Chagos. And if the need for the facilities ever disappeared, the British said the islands would be returned to Mauritius. On September the 24th, 1965, Britain publicly announced independence for Mauritius. Behind the scenes, the colonial secretary prepared the way forward. Present the UN with a fait accompli. Bypass parliament, adopt an order in council, detach Chagos, create a separate colony and do it now. But there was one big problem. What are we going to do with the inhabitants? The British 
and the Americans agreed to proceed on the basis of a lie. They tell the UN that Chagos had no permanent population, that the residents who'd been there for generations, six, seven, eight generations, would all be treated as contract laborers, even if they were only three months old. That was the way around. The object of the exercise is to keep the rocks as ours, a foreign office official wrote, so that Chagos becomes, and I apologize for using the words, but they're in the memorandum, a place with no indigenous population except seagulls in which the Tarzans and the Men Fridays would simply disappear. The Privy Council made its order in council and created the new British Indian Ocean Territory, all of Chagos, which was promptly removed from the constitution of Mauritius. The new Biot commissioner was given the power to forcibly deport the entire population. In New York at the UN, the act prompted an instant reaction. The General Assembly expressed its deep concern and instructed Britain not to violate Mauritius's territorial integrity. Britain just ignored the resolution and all the others that followed. Instead, it gave the Americans a 70 year lease and there would be no charge at any point, a generous British gift. In March, 1968, Mauritius became independent and a month later, it joined the United Nations. Five years later, the Americans had moved in to Diego Garcia. And by then, April, 1973, with Lisby Elise on the last boat out, the Nordwehr, as she described in her video, there was no one there but American troops. That first Christmas, Comedian Mr. Bob Hope visited, accompanied by a troop of 75 performers. They included 32, as he called them, American beauties, and Miss World, a recently crowned Australian. The deportations had by then been completed. 2,000 human beings were removed from their homes and deported to Mauritius and the Seychelles. Some eventually made their way to Gatwick Airport, where they were dumped, which explains why the community of Chagossians in Britain is largely based in Crawley. That is where they went after spending two weeks at Gatwick Airport. For several years, as Mauritius tasted independence, but still highly dependent on Britain for its sugar markets, nothing much happened. But in 1982, things did begin to change. At the UN, the Prime Minister of Mauritius called for the return of Chagos and for the first time said it has been illegally detached. And the Chagossians too began to agitate with courage and with vigor. They litigated using remarkable English counsel, solicitors, barristers, often acting pro bono, some very famous like Nelson Mandela's lawyer, Sidney Kentridge, 100 this year, who I think considers one of his proudest cases to have been to have acted for the Chagossians. They had some success. In 1998, Olivier Bancou, Lisby Elysee's nephew, who I always thought was a lawyer, but recently only discovered was actually an electrician, <laughs> absolutely brilliant legal strategist, won a ruling from the Court of Appeal, wonderful judgment by Stephen Sedley, deportations were totally illegal and everyone should go back. And Robin Cook, the foreign secretary, agreed that they should be able to return to the outer islands. And that was set in motion. But then September the 11th happened. The US base at Diego Garcia was used as part of the Bush administration's program of extraordinary rendition, as they call it, torture, as other people call it, and the embrace of other horrors. Indeed, on the 20th of March, 2003, First planes to bomb Baghdad in a manifestly illegal war flew from Diego Garcia. And so a year later, the British government just decided to reverse the decision of the courts. Madame Elise and the other Chagossians would not be allowed to return. The Chagossians protested in Port Louis and elsewhere, but to no avail. And at that point, for the first time, the Chagossians began to say, this is a crime against humanity. And that was how matters remained for about 10 years. Until 
another foreign secretary, David Miliband, took steps to clean up Britain's reputation associated with all the unpleasantness relating to the uses to which the media reported Diego Garcia had been used. He announced in April 2010 that Britain would create a vast marine protected area over the whole of the Chagos archipelago. The MPA would totally protect all the oceans and all the biodiversity and all the corals and all the fish and everything else, and it would fantastically burnish Britain's green credentials. It would also have the tremendous effect of casting a more favorable light on Chagos following its use for torture and bombing Iraq. In the area, all fishing and human activity would be totally banned with the exception of the yachts for rich people and activities around the military base. The world's coverage of protected oceans would be doubled. The UK takes its international environmental responsibilities seriously, Mr Miliband announced. Conservation groups were thrilled. The Zoological Society of London and the Chagos Conservation Trust, amongst others, declared the announcement to be a historic victory for global ocean conservation. Many others expressed views in support also. WWF, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, and I took to the phone to explain, do you realize what you are supporting? Because none of the NGOs appeared to recognize what the effect of this would be on the Chagossians, who were utterly traumatized by an announcement that would in effect kibosh their ability to return forever. The government of Mauritius too was concerned. As Paul Louis pondered the options, a first little miracle happened called WikiLeaks. It unloaded millions and millions of pages from the internet, US top secret papers. One of them was a cable from the US embassy in London to Washington on Mr. Miliband's fantastic NPA. Mr. Colin Roberts, I feel compelled to name him, director of overseas territories at the Foreign Office, extolled the virtues to the Americans of Mr. Miliband's fantastic vision to create the largest marine reserve in the world, one that would prohibit all human activity, except of course, on and around the US base at Diego Garcia, exclamation mark. The proposal will create no difficulties for the local population, Mr. Roberts explained, because there are no inhabitants. And he went on, and again, I apologize for using his words written in 2009. We do not regret the removal of the population. We do not regret there will be no human footprints, no man Fridays on the uninhabited islands. The Marine Park would, he continued, forever put paid to the resettlement claims of the archipelago's former residents. Marvelous. Environmental protection harnessed to stop the Chagossians, who are truly a poor community in monetary terms, but not in human or moral or other terms. They would never be able to go back. Now, this WikiLeaks document was one of the kind that stiffens the backbone. The Chagossians lodged a new application at the High Court in London to challenge the MPA on the grounds that its true purpose was to stop them from ever going back. That case would be rejected, like others, by the Supreme Court. But not before it threw up, in the process of discovery, a raft of government documents that shun a truly terrible light on Britain's secret actions between 1963 and 1973. And here one has to commend the Chagossians whose legal strategy got hold of these documents. By now too, KPMG was reporting that a return by the Chagossians was actually feasible. Artisanal fishing, small coconut plots, ecotourism could provide jobs and it would have no adverse environmental effects. But the British government decided against resettlement for reasons of feasibility, defense, security, and cost. Mr. Billabman's announcement 
prompted Mauritius to reach out to lawyers. And I was contacted and asked to lead a legal team in Port Louis and from around the world to challenge Britain's actions under international law. The options were limited because the Foreign Office had closed off the possibility of Mauritius suing Britain directly at the International Court of Justice in a contentious case. They changed their declaration of acceptance to preclude that from happening. The only path to the court was an advisory opinion by the UN General Assembly, but we felt at the time that was not possible because we would never get the votes, tiny Mauritius against two permanent members of the Security Council. Instead, the path chosen was arbitration under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to obtain a ruling that the MPA was illegal. Two reasons. One, Mauritius wasn't consulted on what it would do to its fishing rights in Chagos. And two, because Mauritius, not the United Kingdom, was actually the coastal state entitled to create an MPA. The UK had no rights because it had illegally detached Chagos in violation of Resolution 1514 and international law. And a path of justice is not a speedy one. There were three years of written pleadings and then a hearing in Istanbul, and finally a judgment in March 2015. Five arbitrators ruled unanimously that the MPA was indeed unlawful. Mauritius had not been consulted. It was illegal. On the other hand, by a narrow majority, three to two, the tribunal ruled that it couldn't exercise jurisdiction to decide on which of the two countries was the coastal state or on the legal effects of resolution 1514 and its vital principle of maintaining territorial integrity because this was a law of the sea tribunal which only had jurisdiction over maritime matters not sovereignty over land but two arbitrators dissented opining that the tribunal could and should have ruled that mauritius was the coastal state that had not consented to detachment, and most significantly, that Harold Wilson's frighten them with hope strategy amounted to duress. Consent had not truly been obtained. And so the dissenters declared the creation of Britain's last colony was illegal and without any effect. But they were only dissenters, important dissenters. Judge Kateka from Tanzania, Judge Wolf from, from Germany, and what they did was to open a door. We know in life that very often it is dissenting opinions on one day, which five years later become the proper and rightful direction. <laughs> the government of Mauritius asked again, is there a route to the Hague, to the ICJ, the UN's principal judicial organ, the World Court? There was, as I mentioned, the advisory opinion route. In 2010, as I said, we'd advised against it because we didn't think you'd be able to get a majority of the members. But circumstances had changed because of the dissenting opinion. We now had two respected international judges saying there'd been a manifest violation of international law, and none of the three in the majority expressed support for the British view on the merits. They simply said, we don't have jurisdiction over this issue. And now we're into 2016, when a second magical thing happened. In June of that year, Britain voted to leave the European Union. And the consequence of that, as government ministers waxed lyrically about the coming new empire 2.0 and alliances with Commonwealth countries, Britain's international authority suffered an instant and total collapse. Chagos made its way onto the General Assembly bereft of EU help, all other member states said, it's not our problem anymore, you're on your own. In 2017, in June, the General Assembly decided to debate a draft resolution to request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. This was the first time in the history of the UN that every single African country voted in support of the resolution and supported the drafting of the resolution along with the non-aligned movement. I traveled to New York to lobby in June with the Mauritian team as their legal advisor. And as Britain and the US warned that the UN was being used inappropriately, a backdoor route to the court, they said. I spent many hours seated at a small table in the Indonesia lounge in UN headquarters, meeting delegates from dozens of countries, some of whom were my own former students. Over a full day, just two 
delegates out of about 40, a very genial Australian, somewhat sensitive Canadian, expressed any support for Britain, but they did so with very little enthusiasm. What many delegates did do was evoke Britain's continuing colonial instinct, patronizing, entitled, hubristic. And I learned a lot that day, in particular, the huge gap that exists between how Britain sees itself in the world and how the rest of the world sees Britain. Total collapse of authority became clear. The eyebrows raised at the mention of the name of the new foreign secretary, Mr. Boris Johnson, whose articles replete with racist epithets. Again, I apologize for using his words, piccaninnies with watermelon smiles and such words and racially charged put downs of President Barack Obama of the United States were widely known. They may go down very well with readers of the Daily Telegraph. They do not go down well at the United Nations. And so the General Assembly voted by an overwhelming majority to pass Resolution 71292, 94 in favor and just 16 against. The rest were abstentions or absences. Only two EU members, Croatia and Hungary, supported Britain. Only three of the 53 members of the Commonwealth supported Britain. Not a single country from Africa, Latin America, or the Caribbean supported Britain. The General Assembly sent two questions to the court. One, had decolonization been lawfully completed, given the detachment of Chagos? Two, if not, what are the legal consequences. September 2018, the case was heard at the court. The first to speak was Sir Anarud Jugnath, former Prime Minister of Mauritius, the last living survivor of the famous Lancaster House Conference with Harold Wilson in 1965. That first morning in court, the judges watched Lisby Elysee's video, and Lisby Elysee, sitting in the front row, watched the judges watching her. Britain, in turn, argued that the court should simply decline to exercise jurisdiction, but if it did exercise jurisdiction, the detachment was perfectly lawful. The Chagossians, the manner of their removal, indeed, was shameful and wrong, the UK Solicitor General, Mr Buckland, argued, but not the fact that it occurred. Yes, Madame Elise's words were deeply moving, and he expressed deep regret, deep respect to the Chagossians, but nothing more and no expression of regret. No apology, no commitment to right the wrong, no concession on a return. He paid a bit of compensation, that's more than enough. 23 countries spoke. UK and the US were supported by Australia and Israel. The rest of the world, every continent, supported Mauritius. South Africa spoke with a special authority. As five decades earlier, it had taken the position now being articulated by Britain in respect of its illegal occupation of Namibia. As a former colony, council said, we know all about colonialism and deportations and their continuing effects, council explained. And we know what it means when an entire community is taken from its homes on the basis of race. There is no such thing as part freedom, she concluded. Decolonization is never something that happens in part. This was a line taken from Mandela, whose bust coincidentally stood on a pedestal outside the Great Hall of Justice. And the African Union weighed in, describing Lisby Elysee as the voice of Africa. The court delivered its verdict in February 2019. It had jurisdiction. There was no reason not to exercise it. And it had all the facts it needed to decide the matter. These questions were indeed about decolonization, not about a bilateral territorial dispute as Britain and the United States argued. And on the merits, the facts were clear, the court said. The British and Americans had discussed matters. They'd reached an agreement. Chagos was detached and independence followed. The Chagossians were forcibly removed. Those are the words of the court, but strong words. Was decolonization completed in 1968? No, it was not. Resolution 1514 reflected international law in 1965, and it prohibited the disruption 
of the territorial integrity of a country without its consent. Did Mauritius consent? It did not. Paragraph 172 of the court's verdict is crucial, and I quote, having reviewed the circumstances in which the Council of Ministers of the Colony of Mauritius agreed in principle the detachment of the Chagos archipelago on the basis of the Lancaster House Agreement, the court considers that this detachment was not based on the free and genuine expression of the will of the people concerned. That is an immensely powerful statement that has given hope to a lot of people around the world. The detachment of Chagos was not based, therefore, on the free and genuine expression of the will of the people concerned, which meant all the people of Mauritius, including the Chagossi. It followed, in the court's view, that the detachment was unlawful, that a new colony had been created in violation of international law, and that decolonization was incomplete. What are the consequences? The court determined that Britain's occupation of Chagos is totally illegal, and the continued administration was a wrongful act. Britain must end its administration as rapidly as possible, the court ruled. Chagos is part of Mauritius, not the United Kingdom. And the court then passed the bat on to the General Assembly to deal with other matters, including the return of the Chagossians. Only one judge dissented, the American, but she did so not on the merits, only on grounds of jurisdiction. And so this was, in effect, a case without dissent on the merits. All 14 judges supported the conclusion, which gives it particular authority. Three months later, in May 2019, the General Assembly adopted Resolution 73295. It welcomed the court's opinion, affirmed Chagos as an integral part of Mauritius, and ordered Britain to withdraw its colonial administration by November 2019. It determined Chagos Chagossians must be able to resettle and to do so as a matter of urgency. And the resolution ruled the UN, every member, every specialized agency, and every international organization in the world forthwith is ordered to recognize Chagos as part of Mauritius and to ignore any measures purportedly taken by the British in respect of the territory. This resolution got an even bigger majority Support now rose to 116 countries, and only four countries voted with Britain and the United States. Australia, Hungary, Israel, and the Maldives. Embarrassing, the New York Times reported in its story. And it fell after the vote to the British ambassador to offer a last word. Depleted, crumpled, apparently tearful, she sort of dissembled. Britain was, she said, firmly committed to self-determination, just not for Mauritius. She invoked, unbelievably, the Falkland Islands and said there would be no sovereignty until those islands so wished. That was what she said to the General Assembly. It was an intensely awkward moment for many people in the room heard her to be evoking one rule for the whites and another rule for the Blacks. So what happened next? The ICJ advisory opinion and the General Assembly resolution arrived in the dying days of Theresa May's government, landing into the inbox of Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt, who very much hoped to be the next Prime Minister. Whitehall insiders offered him two options. The realist view, you've got to just negotiate with Mauritius and with the Americans and sort it out on the basis of international law. The contrary view, the fundamentalist view, was that this was a matter of fundamental national security, argued by the national security advisor, and to allow Mauritius to have sovereignty over Chagos and Diego Garcia would simply undermine the security of everyone in this room. It could not happen. And that view prevailed. The British government announced that it would not respect the decision of the court. They argued that it wasn't binding as such on the United Kingdom as an advisory opinion, and no, the Chagossians would not be allowed to return. That approach 
instantly made Britain an illegal occupier of the territory of Mauritius and of a part of Africa, just as South Africa was for 25 years after the ICJ's advisory opinion of 1971. So was that the end of the matter? It was not. The advisory opinion has legal effects for the UN and its specialized agency. The UN changed its map of the world. The Food and Agricultural Organization declared that Britain was no longer entitled to fish as a coastal state on the basis of Chagos, and the Universal Postal Union banned the use of any British stamp which carried the word British Indian Ocean Territory. More significantly, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea ruled in a binding judgment that the advisory opinion was determinative and authoritative, and it would proceed to delimit a maritime boundary between Chagos and the Maldives, between Mauritius and the Maldives, not the United Kingdom. Britain's reaction just buried its head in the sand and hoped the problem would somehow go away. We have no doubt about our sovereignty over Chagos, blah, blah, blah. They even suggested through a hapless Minister of Defence, James Heapy, that they might even draw their own maritime boundary with the Maldives. This is now a state of delusion. 28 international judges by now in three different international proceedings had addressed Chagos and not a single one had expressed support for the United Kingdom's view on the merits. This is Britain in total wonderland. This is what we have become. Across the world, complete incredulity. What happened to the country that believed in the international rule of law? I am frequently asked. To be sure, as we all know, this is part of a bigger picture. A country, a government that treats judges and lawyers with contempt, which sees international law as a mere inconvenience and believes that international agreement, I'm thinking of the Northern Ireland Protocol, can just be shredded at will. Trust and credibility are just shot to pieces. And the Americans too now face a major difficulty, calling the Russians and the Chinese to account for their illegal incursions, but themselves now occupying illegally a part of Africa. Private companies also continue to milk the British Indian Ocean Territory's generosity and largesse. A private company called Shaw continues to offer telecom services on the British Indian Ocean Territory. And if you're a football or sports fan, you may recognize the hoardings from your television sets or if you go to matches for a company called sportsbet.io. I wonder if you've ever asked yourself what the letters IO stand for. They stand for Indian Ocean. And this is a domain name which is immensely valuable and which has been assigned nominally to the British Indian Ocean Territory by the, with the support of the United Kingdom government. Someone out there is making tens of millions of pounds every year on the basis of this domain name, none of which goes to the Chagossians or the Mauritian government. This is really a situation that is absolutely deplorable in which reputable organizations like the Zoological Society of London and others continue to simply bury their head in the sand and hope that all this will go away. Now, it may be that those engaged in authorizing or engaging these activities will begin to reflect on their association with such manifest and gross international illegality and on the human consequences for the Chagossian community. But of course, international law treats forcible deportations and the refusal to allow people to go back to their lawful homes, which is a consequence of the ICJ's decision as a crime under international law. I described this at some length in East West Street, Hirsch Lauterpacht, who put the concept of crimes against humanity into the Nuremberg statute and international law, and in its article six, paragraph C, with Robert Jackson, the chief prosecutor, characterized deportation, the forcible transfer of a group from one territory to another as a crime against humanity. And that's been recognized ever since. In the 1949 Geneva Conventions and in Article 7 of the Statute of the International Criminal Court. In about two and a half weeks, Human Rights Watch are gonna produce a report 
on the situation in relation to Chagos and the Chagossians in particular, and I believe it is likely to characterize Britain and the United States as complicit in a crime against humanity in relation to the treatment of the Chagossians. That will be the first time Human Rights Watch has ever done that in relation to those two countries. So what's to be done? There is, I think, a clear and reasonable solution, one that respects properly the intertwined issues, the territorial integrity of Mauritius, the rights of the Chagossians, the protection of the environment, and matters of national security. All of that can be addressed in a single agreement between the various countries. Mauritius has made clear that the base can stay under Mauritian sovereignty, that it wants the Chagossians to be allowed to return, and that the area will be subject to a proper and lawful marine conservation area in which the Chagossians become stewards of that particular area. And that, of course, leaves the Chagossians, who are the beating heart of this story. They are a very large group now, second, third, and fourth generation, and I've come to know them, different members of that large group, over the past decade. They are many individuals and groups with many different views and aspirations. Some want to return to the outer islands of Chagos, including Peros Banos, or work at the US base on Diego Garcia, alongside the other nationals who work there today. The outer islands have sustained human habitation for more than two centuries, and they will continue to do so, at least for some point into the future. They're far from Diego Garcia. They pose no security threat whatsoever, as the House of Lords made clear in a judgment 20 years ago. There is an easy win-win-win outcome. Security, human rights, the marine environment, respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, and the rights of the population, an impecunious population, can all be assured. The rule of law, treaties, the law of the sea, can all be promoted. Charges of hypocrisy and double standard can be cast to the wind. This is not a zero-sum game. In the face of Britain's resolute unwillingness to recognize the rule of law, I decided to write this book, The Last Colony, to basically help the Chagossians be able to return to Chagos and Mauritius and Africa if they wish to do so, and to encourage Britain to lower its flag on the last colony in Africa, its last colony in Africa. It seems there is a change in the air. In February, about a year ago, Mauritius decided for the first time in its history to launch an expedition to the Chagos archipelago without UK permission. And the British did not try to stop them. Organized a site visit in the context of the proceedings before the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. We gathered in Seychelles, there was a, a typhoon uh, in Mauritius. We were 25 Mauritian government officials marine scientists, journalists, lawyers, academics, and of course, largest group of Chagossians, quite rightly, including Lisbeth Elisee and four of her closest friends, her nephew Olivier, Marcel, her childhood friend from Ile du Coin, wonderful fisherman, Rosamund, who spent her first 17 years on Salomon Island, and Suzelle, forcibly removed from Diego Garcia at the age of 11 months, with the label contract laborer stuck to her head. We sailed on a boat called the Bleu de Nîmes, a thousand mile journey. This was the first time Mauritius had ever visited its own territory. It was the first time the Chagossians had ever gone without an armed British export. It was the first time the journalists were allowed to go and it was my first time. We spent six days at sea getting there, and as the boat approached Pejos Banos, I saw the place of Lisby Elise's birth. Remarkable, sandy fringe, palm trees of Ile du Coin, the reefs, the waves, the birds. The anchor was lowered. Lisby pointed to the place of her birth, and her smile was enormous. Her eyes literally danced. She was the first person who got off the boat and touched the island, and I won't easily forget that moment. The first thing she did was to bend down, put her hand in the water and pick up a handful of this incredible white sand and just let it pass through her fingertips. Olivier 
sank to his knees with the other Chagossians, and then they stood up and prayed as the rest of us basically cried. But remarkably, after about 23 minutes of prayer, it was to work. And without batting an eyelid, they were off to the church and the cemeteries to clean them all up. And that's largely what happened over the next few days. Nature had crushed colonial civilization. The buildings remained, but in a state of real wreckage. There were repairs to be made to the graves, and the churches, and to the other buildings. And I won't easily forget, as we left, Lisby on the beach, perched on a long, thin, sturdy trunk of an old palm that had fallen across the sand and which hung over the blue water. She bounced up and down on this palm tree like a kid just laughing wildly, like when I was a child, she said. And later that afternoon, she and we all danced to the rhythms of the favorite Chagossian songs. I think you might want to listen in particular to one called Perros Vert, which is wonderful, and another called Grand Maman Chagossian, Chagossian Grandmother. And later, as we headed back, sitting on the deck of the boat, she and Marcel reminisced about their childhoods on this very island and beach, playing hide and seek between the palms. Marcel was just the same back then, she said to us all. He was busy, busy, busy. And what was Lisby like? One of us asked Marcel. He looked at us silently and offered his fantastic, magical, mellow grin, which infused his entire face. And he just said, just the same, round, round, round. Mm -hmm. He laughed, stood, puffed out his body, stooped and sort of waddled away, bouncing on the beach. And we all roared with laughter. And then he went over to Lisby and he put his fingers on her forehead. It was a whole lifetime of affection in a single touch, opening up the possibility that they would go back. And they will go back because unbelievably something changed in Britain. In November, under the remarkable influence of a premiership that lasted, I think, 49 days, Britain decided to change tack. And the Foreign Secretary announced in Parliament that Britain and Mauritius would now negotiate on the exercise of sovereignty on the basis of international law. And those negotiations are now underway. The end could therefore be in sight. Very soon, I and others hope, the flag will come down on Britain's last colony in Africa. It will mark the end of one age and the beginning of another one, a new moment, one that might allow us to look back with greater honesty and also to look forward with some hope and decency and principle and a recognition that sometimes the law really can help people who come from disadvantaged communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. Um, we've now got time for some questions and answers after what I can see was an absolutely outstanding lecture. I heard nothing from the crowd. It was just, it, well, it was also one of the joys of being back with people hearing lectures live. So thank you so much for that. Um, as you said, deeply uncomfortable at times, but a, a fantastic story, exceptionally well told. Thank you so much. So we have some time for some question, either on the last colony or anything else from your, your outstanding repertoire of work. In, there we go. The first question. The first one. Thank you. Um, I'll stand, I'll stand over here. So my name is Peter. I'm a law student. Um, just you mentioned in a podcast you did with uh, asymmetric haircuts. You said, uh, despite the the kind of shocking picture this paints of Britain um, today, maybe the only good thing we have left is that you can stand here and say 
look how bad we are. Look, look what's happened. You know, and I think that's that's worth considering that at least um, we can have this conversation. But I wanted to ask two things. The first is, do you have any insight on the um, status of the negotiations? Um, do you think you know a favorable outcome will be reached where Chagossians can return? Or do you think we'll all be surprised in, in a shocking way again? Um, the second thing is the broader kind of international law comment. Um, I think that uh, advisory opinions as a mechanism for uh, sort of redress, uh, especially for sort of developing countries um, who have faced colonial oppression, I think this is becoming something more frequent. Um, do you have a comment on that, on, on how advisory opinions are kind of a, a liberating tool uh, in, in the modern era? Sure. Well, good luck with your law studies. Glad you're here and glad you're going to be on board. Um, I often say that one of the things that I feel deeply proud of, of Britain, which has many very wonderful aspects to it, is I think it's probably the only country in the world where when you spend, I mean, not, I, I mean I've been litigating against the UK internationally for my entire career, no one has ever criticized me for that. I have excellent relations with the Foreign Office. My independence as a barrister has been totally 100% respected. And that is a magnificent thing in this country. I mean, there are some signs that some people would like to criticize lawyers for the kinds of cases that they do. And I really hope there will be cross-party political support to cut that down. You know the kinds of things that I'm referring to, but I really do think it's an amazing thing for barristers and solicitors in this country. And I have excellent relations with the legal advisors at the Foreign Office. And I, has not been harmed, they understand that I'm acting in a professional capacity. This is not the same with other countries. I have two nationalities, I'm, I'm also French. And I acted against France, I've done that against France on several occasions, but in 1995, I acted for the Pacific Island States on the uh, resumption of nuclear testing in uh, the Pacific. And to this day, 28 years later, the Quai d'Orsay has not forgiven me. Un Francais ne plaide pas contre son propre pays. A Frenchman does not plead against his own country. And that is the view in most countries. And I, you know, Britain is a complete outlier on this issue. And I think it's a magnificent thing. And I am deeply grateful for it. And incredibly proud to be a member of the English Bar, which just protects us all and enables us to act for whoever instructs us on whatever issue, unchallenged and unthreatened. On the negotiations, I'm afraid I can't say anything because I have a certain participation in the negotiations and you'll understand that um, they are continuing and therefore I, I would prefer not to say anything at all. On the advisory opinion issue, I mean, I think it's a mixed record. I think there's some things that have been incredibly um, significant, uh, Southwest Africa, uh, I think, 1971 advisory opinion on Namibia, uh, Chagos, I think, just is a miracle, if, particularly if the negotiations go in a good way. People will look at this as an absolutely remarkable moment. But there are many other cases where the court has blinked. I'm thinking of nuclear weapons and other cases where the advisory opinion has made a little bit of a difference, but has not brought a transformative effect. So I think it is something that's going to be used more and more. One of the things that I've learned from this experience, I mean, I didn't have time tonight to go into all of the detail and everything. As some of you will know, there's lots of talk right now about an advisory opinion from the ICJ on climate change, and one has gone to the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. It's really important to get the questions right. I mean, we were a group of six or seven, we spent two years crafting the questions on the Chagos case. And the golden rule for us was we can't give the court any wiggle room. It has, the first question has to be a binary in which it's either yes or no. It's not a maybe, it's not a perhaps, it's either legal or it's not legal. And if it's not legal, what happens? And getting that right, which involved numerous wonderful, wonderful lawyers. I mean, it, one of the lessons for the students here is you really need to learn to work in teams. One person, two people, three people can't address these kinds of issues. And you've got to be people from different cultures and different backgrounds, because the best ideas often come out of left field. Sometimes the youngest people have the best ideas. I learned that from James Crawford, who sadly is no longer with us. But you've got to listen to everyone. 
and just have a sort of flat decision-making collegial process. So the best ideas come out, but you've got to take time with your questions. And my concern, and I'll say this very publicly about the questions that are circulating on the ICJ advisory opinion, is that they have not been drafted with a great deal of attention to who sits on the court. And that was the other thing. It's not that, you know, you want to create a tiny little community of lawyers who happen to do all the cases. I'm, I think my students will know I'm very against that. But you've got to look at who's sitting on the court. You can't just draft questions willy-nilly and imagine they're going to keel over and give you the answers that they want. And the, and the classic catastrophe was the, was the nuclear weapons advisory opinion of 1995. It was just, it's been a total disaster in which the court in the end gives an opinion which basically says, well, if your vital, if your existence is at stake, you might be able to use nuclear weapons, which is, of course, what Vladimir Putin said a few months ago, citing the ICJ advisory opinion. So, yes, if done properly and carefully and with reflection and a clear view of the kinds of people who sit on the International Court of Justice. So it's a nuanced response. Thank you, Peter. Other questions? Someone right back over there. Like <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and, and thanks to uh, a, 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 the person who asked the last question, which I, I want yeah, to. That's a great question. Follow. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated that yeah, that we do. There is something uh, about Britain, about British culture. My, I mean, my own mother decided to, uh, you know, make her emigration here permanent because of the Guardian and because of feminism and because of we, we don't have to identify uh, national characteristics with the state, um, and 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 that's something that's you know very clear from from all your work. Um, I say this in the context of at the moment disseminating the BBC documentary on. Narendra Modi to uh, uh, people in India who are forbidden from watching this because the Indian government has invoked emergency powers to stop them from doing so. And it's important sometimes to recognize uh, the difference um, and to recognize uh, and protect against our current Home Secretary uh, the freedoms that we have uh, here. My question though is, this isn't necessarily your job. I wonder, the story you've told is such a gift to media and satirists and so on. I'm sure there's been the odd article in The Guardian, The New Statesman, but I don't know, has there been the piece on the last leg? Did Frankie Boyle take it up? Has it been big on TikTok? You would have thought that, that, that this cause of the Chagossians would, would be something that would be taken up in the popular imagination. Maybe it didn't need to be because maybe deploying the law and maybe international pressure uh, in the light of only three other states standing with, I wouldn't say us, the British government, uh, made that unnecessary. But why was it that this didn't uh, uh, grab the popular imagination? It's a great question. Just before you get there, let, let me just say, I mean, it, the, the media for cases like this are hugely important. Um, you know, we were very lucky when we traveled to Chagos last February, we had three fantastic journalists from the BBC, um, total independence. As we entered the exclusive economic zone of Mauritius, as we believe it to be, something amazing happened. We lost all internet connection. Okay, it was incredible. It only resumed six days later, seven, eight days later, as we left the exclusive economic zone. So, you know, it may just be completely a technical snaggeroo, or more likely perhaps someone decided to destroy the signal and make it impossible to report back. But one of the enduring memories that I will have of the entire trip was the BBC journalists have got these sort of teeny little satellite things that they can just put up anywhere and they point it to some satellite that's up there. And so they were able to broadcast. And for the rest of us, because it costs about two and a half thousand quid an hour or something, we got about two minutes of internet a day 
thanks to the BBC. But the upshot was it was the stuff was broadcast all over the world and it got an absolutely huge audience. I, you know, when we finally got into the net signal again, we all had, you know, like thousands of WhatsApps and text messages and interview requests and so on and so forth. Um, so the free media and the free BBC, it, it really is incredibly important. Um, so I think it's really clear to me, I think I can answer your question. Firstly, there's been a lot more attention. There was, you know, incredible Olivier Boncou, you know, in the wilderness for decades, plugging away, doing his incredible, incredible work. And it's finally come good. And that's an amazing thing. But really, it's been an exponential rise in media attention. But I'll answer your question in this way. So you write a book about Nazis and you write a book about a group of black people who are subject to appalling discriminatory and in my view, criminal practice. Same author, same writing style, you know, what happens in the United Kingdom? Well, and it's a book about Nazis. You get deluge with requests for interviews, radio, television, blah, 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 because everyone, particularly in the mail, the telegraph, the express, love to make us feel better about ourselves by focusing on the horrors perpetrated by others. Then take a story, which is about the horrors that we perpetrate, plainly, if it was against white people, I'm gonna say this clearly because that is my view and it's Olivier Boncou's view, the media would be all over it. If it was the Falkland Islanders, you can imagine how much media attention there would be, but it's not. It's 2000 black people and there is no escaping what is going on. It is so crystal clear. And it's been a real wake up call for me to live through an experience and see how lopsided are the levels and matters of interest. I can't even begin to imagine what it is like to be a member of that community. But I felt the teeniest tip of the iceberg and it makes me furious. And we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about where we have gone wrong in the past. There is no conversation really about the colonial legacy. There is no real conversation. It's beginning actually. I think the toppling of the statue in Bristol was a great thing because it sort of suddenly unleashed in you know public consciousness to think, well, actually, yeah, how would you feel walking down the street and having to see a statue of some Nazi leader? You wouldn't feel so great about it. And all of a sudden people started asking themselves questions in a different way. But, but you know, I don't think it's about self-flagellating, but we've got ourselves, I think, in a country and we know we're in a really bad place right now. And part of the reason we are in this really bad place is because we have not begun to be honest about who we are and what our place is in the world, what we have done, what consequences we have wrought. And, and it, you know, we are where we are. And I think the first step is to start being more honest about that. And then things can begin to repair themselves. But your point is an important one. There's been almost no attention to this, although interestingly, I was very happy that on University Challenge recently, one of the questions was about a small island in the Indian Ocean, which is claimed by two countries. What is the archipelago called? I was amazed. So very slowly, you know, things creak into position in the wonderful United Kingdom, but there's plainly a problem. And I, I think that what this experience has done is it's really energized me and in terms of the kind of work that LAP does, because essentially poverty and race and discrimination are all completely intertwined. And, and we know that, and we sort of try not to think about it too much, but that is the reality. And I think a more honest engagement with those issues will tease these issues out. And so that's a good thing. It's been a real eye opener for me being involved in this matter and to get to know and a privilege to get to know the Chagossian community for this reason.
it's shone a light for me on the nature of modern Britain. You said if I could bottle your wise yeah. words, I really would, that would be fantastic. Um, aware of time, we do want to come on to me, but is anybody feel good because we could here for hours, so I can talk question there, and one for Joss, and then one uh, to their yeah. right. So then we Why don't we take two, to, two and three together, and then I, I do yes. prattle on, I know. There, and then yeah. I've got some... Thank you. Um, oh, right. Over here. Cool. Hi. Um, thank you. Uh, I suppose I like within the book you kind of specifically kind of refer to during the war on terror and the uses that Diego Garcia has put to, and you kind of question how the Che Gaussians would feel about that if they had known about that when that was happening. But then, it, unless I'm unless something's changed, uh, the Mauritian government has made it very clear that they're happy to keep the arrangement with the U.S. for military operations on Diego Garcia, right? Um, so I suppose just like in that context and in the context of US military bases across 70 to 80% of the world's countries, like what are the implications then of that kind of understanding of self-determination and on a broader level kind of decolonization if it doesn't address kind of the way that states are happy to continue those arrangements? And then Chevron as well. Right. So we'll you've articulated brilliantly the somewhat dysfunctional relationship that Britain has with its imperial past um, and its refusal to um, either discuss it in any honest way or, or really look at the, the, the continuing legacy of that. Um, it reminds me of um, the way that other countries have looked at their own shameful pasts and have made some attempt um, to, to, come to, 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 to come to some kind of, of reconciliation. That, for example, the truth of reconciliation process in South Africa, or the way that Germany has, has looked at its own past over the last generation or so. Are there models um, which exist that, that Britain could try and emulate in that, in that sense? And um, somewhat pessimistically, is there any hope in hell that we'll actually do it? Um, hi, uh, I wanted to ask a question about the colonial legacy in relation to Commonwealth. And in relation to who? To the Commonwealth and negotiations moving forward. Do you feel that um, looking at infrastructure around economics, trade, human rights, and from what he said about structures such as the World Bank that was utilised by the Germans um, in terms of reparations, do you feel these are things that can be looked at progressively for win-win solutions that can benefit everybody? Because I think, yes, there are, there is accountability, but there is also progression. I think if you go throughout humanity, way, way back, ev everybody has been somewhere on the spectrum. And as a human race, how do we move forward? Because we've got a lot going on in our planet and us battling each other over these small titles when the bigger title is, we are human. When is that going to be put at the forefront so we can progressively move forward? Three pretty great questions and we've only got one and a half minutes. I mean, um, so, I mean, the base issue is obviously complex and when we first acted, I described it in the book, there was a cross-party political support in Mauritius, um, which is a country which has a very good relationship with the United Kingdom and the United States, very close to India, for obvious reasons. And there was no desire to sort of break with that generally positive relationship. There was also the fact that we as lawyers who appear before places like the International Court of Justice had a very clear understanding that it was one thing to invite these judges to declare that decolonization was not complete. It would be quite another if we were to be in a position where in effect we were inviting the judges to close down a large British and American military base. 
And I think from a tactical and strategic position, it was immensely helpful to be able to say to the judges, the base will remain under Mauritian sovereignty, which actually is not potentially without certain consequences. Um, and I think the case may have gone differently if we had effectively been calling on the judges to expel the British and the Americans from Diego Garcia. The, the, where the rubber hits the road is the question of if there is to be a settlement on this, what happens on Diego Garcia in relation to, to the population that was removed from Diego Garcia, because obviously they'd like to be able to go back. And one of the things that I think has been quite helpful in that sense is that the United States generally has a policy um, in other places. I don't know whether it would be the same policy here if it was to be applied, but in other places, that it gives primacy to employing locals on its military bases. And so there is room, I think, there to accommodate certain, I think, my personal view, very legitimate interests. Um, but there are others who say in Mauritius the base should go, and you no, know, and I again respect all of the views that are held. That's a political matter for Mauritius to decide, I think, who it wants there, if anyone. And as a lawyer for a state, you you know, you don't express views on such matters. You're basically given an instruction and you have conversations and so on and so forth. But I think that's a political matter for Mauritius and it's a political matter for the Chagossians. Certainly the largest Chagossian group in Mauritius was fully comfortable with that approach. But there are other Chagossian groups that disagree with the approach and they air their views as they're absolutely entitled to do. And so I think these questions will play out uh, as we go forward, but it's a legitimate question to ask um, as a counterfactual, if Mauritius had taken a different position, what would have happened before the court? I don't think we would have got a unanimous decision. We may have got a decision that went the same way, but I can assure you there would have been, um, there would have been some dissenters and, and that would have had consequences. I think one of the reasons the opinion has such power is because it is effectively without dissent. Um, and, and, and that in the context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict is significant because um, it's very tough for Britain to be, you know, having a go at Russia for its illegal occupation of Ukraine whilst at the same time illegally occupying part of Africa. And this is a real issue with African countries. I mean, I know from my friends, I do a lot of work in Africa for African governments on various international cases. And they just say it's total double standard, it's total hypocrisy. And I think the British government has understood that they've got to sort this out if they're going to have any credibility on, on these um, other issues. I mean, the question of how you get from A to B when you've got a dodgy past, which of course every community has, every household has, every individual has, it's a universal thing that everyone's got skeletons. Every community has skeletons. And how do you sort it out? I think the first, I, I don't think there is a sort of cookie cut a one size fits all. I think it's really very factually specific. I think Britain just hasn't done it at all. I mean, whether it's Northern Ireland or the other matters that I've addressed, there's no real attempt to engage with the horrors of the past. You just like push it away and pretend that it hasn't happened. And that in my view is plainly wrong. I think there should be truth and reconciliation in relation to Northern Ireland. I think there should be truth and reconciliation in relation to enslavement. I've written a paper supporting the principle of reparations for enslavement. I think what Germany has done in relation to the genocide, as Germany has called it, of the Herero population in 1908 in Namibia is admirable. Germany is probably the only country in the world that has truly sought to engage with aspects of its past. Um, but even that raises difficulties, as you will know, some of you in the room. Germany recognized that what happened in 1908 was a genocide. That's an incredible concession to make legally because genocide didn't exist as a legal term. 
in 1900 notes. So it is, in effect, the retroactive application of a term invented in 1945 to events occurring in 1900 note. And why would you stop in 1900 note? And if you can do it with genocide, why can't you do it with crimes against humanity? And if you can do it with crimes against humanity, why can't you go back to enslavement? Of course you can go back to enslavement. It's a continuing violation, in my view. And so the question of responsibility arises. Now, the trick is going to be how you deal with the reparation issue. Is it an apology under international law? International law is very flexible. It can be an apology, it can be a declaration, it can be monetary, it can, there's lots of different ways of dealing with it. And the discussions between Germany and Namibia are stuck because Germany wants, Germany has offered 1 billion euros to Namibia, but as development assistance. And Namibia wants it as reparation. And Germany reasonably recognizes that the moment you call it reparation based on a legal obligation, the floodgates potentially open. So I think there's a really important conversation to be had about what you call and characterize such things. I understand the instinct for reparation. I understand the instinct to avoid opening the floodgates. So between those two positions, how do you reasonably carry out a way of moving forward that is legitimate? That's a really tough question. But I think the first part of answering that question is to say, we will engage in an honest look at ourselves. And if you don't do that, you just might as well give up. It's hopeless. And I think that's what Britain's decided. They don't want to talk about colonialism. They don't want to talk about enslavement. They don't want to talk about Northern Ireland. They don't want to talk about the Iraq war. They don't, you know, I mean, Iraq a bit, Chilcot inquiry, I suppose. But is there a real willingness? It's, it's I don't think it's, it's, it's really there. So this is a very, very big question. Um, I mean, this is related, obviously, also, to the important question that you've asked. I, and the Commonwealth is a really curious creature, actually. Um, I mean, there's a hangover of colonialism. And personally, I find it pretty weird that so many countries would want to pay deference, in a sense, to a historic relationship. But that's their right to do that. If that's what they decide they want to do, we've got to respect that that is the decision. I mean, why so many of them still have the monarch as head of state, but it's their decision. They've got to sort out. That's what self-determination means. But in terms of the mechanisms for going forward, I mean, just building on the previous answer, I mean, we live, I mean, it comes back to the themes of this conference, of, 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 of this, of, of LAP. Poverty is at the heart of these issues. Can't talk about poverty without talking about inequality. There is inequality in this society in the United Kingdom. There's inequality around the world. Until you begin to address that honestly, I don't think you can begin to answer those problems. And the colonizing communities have despoiled and profited and benefited at the expense of the former colonized. And the industrialized countries have profited and benefited benefited at the expense of the newly industrializing countries in relation to climate change issues. And so my own feeling is we are all in this together. We're gonna to have to reach an accommodation and a settlement. And there is no way around the simple proposition that there's gonna to have to be a mega transfer of resources and funds. I don't see any way around it. Otherwise you just set you know, in stone, the inequality, it just it's just there forever. So what that I think effectively means is we have to be willing to give over a very large part of our assets and resources to others to help them. And I'm totally in favor of tax rates for people like me of 70, 80, 90%. That's the right thing to do. It's plainly the right thing to do. It simply makes no sense at all to have these kind of equalities in the national community and then somehow expect the rest of the world not to raise questions 
about it. So I think we just have to, I just think something's gone very wrong in the last 40 years in terms of our expectations, our desire for wealth, our desire for assets. And we need to recognize that and we have to be willing to share. And that is gonna mean some pretty tough decisions going forward. But I don't see any other way of dealing with it unless you want a world that is forever completely unequal. And I don't want that sort of a world. So international law will begin to cut in on these issues. International law is gonna start talking about things like reparations or you know, a response to the legacy of enslavement and colonialism. It has to, um, and I think that's a good thing. And I think this case actually marks a pretty significant step in that direction. I mean, in terms of the International Court of Justice, for me, this is one of the most important decisions they have ever taken because it corrects a historic wrong. And that leads the way to how we can deal that with other wrongs also, which is taking ownership of where things went wrong. So it's a great question. Thank you. You've all been fantastic questions. Uh, Joss has got promised that this is going to be a short last question, and then we're going to come on to Nick, and then we do have refreshments and everything else, but again, there's not a noise in the, in the room tonight, and we've spelled, we all need to spell right. And and the thing, I'm, I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to pose a question that we don't need to answer now, but we do want you to answer afterwards. And it's also when? a question to other people in this room. And there's also a question to the board of Lawyers Against Poverty, and I'm cheating because of the founder of my part of the question. And also Lawyers Against Poverty as a movement is run by its members and they vote. And we have a small fund which members contribute to called the Justice Fund, which sets up to run things like strategic litigation, mm -hmm. which we've funded in the past in several cases, like funding conferences. Caroline was involved in a conference on strategic litigation in Nairobi for 300 people across Africa on um, human rights litigation. So there's a question to lawyers against poverty as to whether it's up for this bigger challenge you asked about, which is a conference, a conversation about reparation, about the colonial legacy and what we do about it as lawyers. There's a question to you as if we had a group of lawyers who called themselves lawyers against poverty or were lawyers who considered they were against poverty and they decided that they wanted to come together to facilitate a dialogue, a conversation about reparation, about legal aspects of the colonial legacy, how would you recommend that they go about it? And I'm not asking you to answer that question now, I think it's a, mm. it's a longer conversation, but I'm, I'm kind of sensing from what you said that there is a need to do it, and this may be a moment where it becomes possible to do it more previously. Mm. I would also like to invite the members of this room in just one moment to give a round of applause for you, for this great talk, and then I'm going to hand over. So, could I just so should I, but should I, should I, should I just try to try to address that because you may not want to applaud after I say what I. You may, you may not. Um, so I'm touched and moved by what you've just said because I do think this is a moment. I think there is something happening. I think, I think, I think there is a big shift taking place. In my book, I describe, I compare 1966 and the Southwest Africa case, which ruled, where the court ruled unbelievably that Liberia and Ethiopia had no legal interest in the mistreatment by South Africa of the residents of Southwest Africa. I mean, it's just incredible. That was the court in 66, Chagos is the court in 2018. So we have definitely moved along, but it's plain, and I'm just, I'll just speak, so the answer is yes, I think it'd be wonderful if you do it. And here's why I think it'd be wonderful if you do it, because, there is a, a sort of monopoly of those who have pushed the issue of let's look at the colonial legacy and, uh, and issues of reparations. And essentially, it's the community that's been on the receiving end. 
that has raised these issues. And I've had to ask myself, and I've done it quite openly in the book, some pretty searching questions. How could it be that it took until 2010 for me, who thinks of myself as a pretty progressive person, I just haven't engaged with these issues. So, so like, what went wrong? Like, how could I not have focused on these issues until I got instructed in this case? And I looked long and hard at that and concluded that it must be something to do with my education. I must have been basically brainwashed when I was a kid. And so I went back, and I described this in the book and found my school history book, which some of you who are old enough will remember. Geoffrey Treese, This Is Your Century, chapter eight. Sunset on Empire, published in 66 or 67. We used it when we were 12, so that was 1972, 73. It, it's totally shocking what, what we were indoctrinated with. Chapter begins with India. Comparison between the magnificent Viscount Mountbatten, last governor of India, as compared with the new bloke, Thin, vegetarian, pacifist. I'm really, again, sorry to use these words. Looks like a monkey wearing glasses. That's what I read when I was a 12 year old. That's what I read. That's what we were taught. That's what kids were taught. And my own kids who are now in their 20s, I don't know how it was for you guys, but they didn't learn very much more, frankly, at school about Britain's colonial past and how Britain has treated certain communities around the world. So this has been a real wake up call for me over the last 12 years. And I think the idea of a community like this, which is not looking around the room, with some exceptions, dominated as a black community, it would send out a big signal to say, actually, we really care about this issue. I, mean, I now go to conferences on reparations and, you know, even held in this country, places like Cambridge University, very few white people in the room. Very, very few white people in the room. It's really striking. So I've been, so my world has sort of been turned upside down by this experience, in a sense. And I think for a group like LAP, which represents very diverse community to say, actually, you know, it's time to start thinking about this issue, would I think send a pretty strong signal and would encourage others to start thinking about these kinds of issues. And so I really feel positive about that suggestion. And there are many different ways of doing it. You know, it can be done in a very non-confrontational sort of way, but to say, actually, it's time to have a conversation. Let's talk about Kevin, kind of thing, you know? That would be great. Thank you for proposing that. Fantastic. Yeah. Finish the <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, um, I'm conscious that I'm uh, the only thing standing between uh, uh, Philippe's wonderful talk and, and you and drinks. So I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, so I'm, uh, I lead the legal team at, uh, of ours, um, of ours big campaign group. And um, it means voice in 40 languages. So it's about taking the voice of ordinary people into the corridors of power. Um, and I was asked not really to reflect on what Philippe said, though I will echo some of it. I was asked to talk about uh, the role of lawyers in a time of crisis. Um, so I mean, I'd asked, what do we mean by crisis? And uh, as I was listening to you, Philippe, I, um, I, I want to try and sort of frame that. Uh, what really leapt out from your talk was when you were talking about Marcel, Marcel and Liz Bialy's on the beach remembering their childhoods as they scampered around the um, palm tree. And I'd like to invite you all just to sort of 
if you want to close your eyes or just uh, reflect, for, think about your Marcel and Liz Bialese. Who are the youngsters who are close to you, whom you deeply care about? Could even be yourself if you're young enough. But just for a second, uh, think about that. Try and visualize them and hold them in your mind and your, your heart. So for me, it's my children. It's uh, uh, Isabel, who's six, and Aidan, who's eight. And um, I would just, that sort of, I want to introduce a video that's 30 seconds long, um, which I'll ask Gemma to play in a, in a second. Um, but this is a, sets a scene for the crisis that I think we're in. We're obviously in interlocking crises. There's democracy, disinformation, biodiversity law. <laughs> but I'm gonna talk about climate and focus on climate in particular tonight and its impact on younger people and Isabel and Aiden and whomever you've uh, held in mind. Um, and this is a piece of work that uh, of ours put into the world. So um, uh, I won't bore you with the details, but um, if it's, a, it's, a, it's a clip about climate anxiety. It's the Guterres, the UN Secretary General talking to the UN General Assembly and using a climate study into um, climate anxiety in young people uh, as a, a, a stick with which to beat them, to inspire them to, uh, to take greater action. Um, Emma, if you could play it. So, so very powerful. And I'm, I just, what, what I always, uh, when I watch that, I think about when he talks about Los Ninos and Los Ninas and the responsibilities we owe to them right now uh, for coming up with a plan, uh, for demonstrating that we understand the gravity of the situation and that we're gonna do something about it um, to save humanity and the planet. And um, you know that, that word now that he uses, that's the crisis we're in. And that's where I think it frames your role as lawyers. It is now, it's now or never, um, the science, tells us that we need to halve carbon emissions by 2030, and yet they're still going up. And if we look at whether we have a plan, uh, you only need to look at um, a recent climate conference in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, which ended in a fudge, and look forward to the next climate conference, which will be in the United Arab Emirates, uh, chaired by the, uh, the CEO of the state oil company, uh, to see that there will be no plan, uh, not from our governments. And I think that uh, links back to Marcel and Liz BLEs, uh, because just as they were ripped from the shores of paradise, uh, however many years ago it was, I think there is a great danger that we are going to rip our young people from the shores of their paradise and the biosphere, fragile and beautiful, and they deserve to live in, but they won't because just as the Chagossians were robbed of their paradise by an uncaring government, so are the youth of the world being robbed of theirs by uncaring governments who will not get their act together. So that brings us to what the lawyers do. I'd be like Philippe. Um, you all are in here in this room because you are committed to uh, doing something about poverty. In, the climate anxiety study actually relates to some of the litigation we're supporting. We're, we're suing 36 governments, or we're involved in suing 36 governments in three continents and three courts. Um, one of which is a case by the Duarte Agostino uh, versus Portugal and others case at the European Court of Human Rights that will come to for its hearing imminently by the end of March. Um, and the climate anxiety issue is, is relevant to that, the, the, uh, the jurisprudence in that case. Now, obviously not everybody can be before the International Court of Justice. Not everybody can be before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, what about you? Um, I think you, if you saw any headlines last week of Greta Thunberg in Davos, uh, throwing down a cease and desist letter to these, the chief executives of the oil industry. And my legal team wrote that cease and desist letter and helped put Fatih, um, 
uh, Greta on the stage with Fatih Birol. Uh, we had no idea she would actually show up. Um, she is nobody's puppet and uh, we, nobody controls her, but we helped make that happen. Um, the, but Greta famously said, no one is too small to make a difference. I think that's this really beautiful thing to bear in mind. We can be fancy lawyers, we can go and do fancy work, but one girl sitting down outside the Swedish parliament with a placard four years ago, fundamentally up, turned the world upside down. It's the most inspiring thing I've ever seen. It's the most powerful social change uh, theory of change I have ever seen. And social change is my professional living. Um, and it does beg the question what the 100, team, 100 strong team of Avaz professionals are actually doing. Uh, when um, Greta can do that, we're just just by sitting down on, on the steps of the parliament. But, but how about you? Well, it is now or never. It is this decade. So, and no one is too small to make a difference. So it doesn't have to be huge and systemic. And I think you, I would invite you to talk to your clients about their role in this. One of the things that strikes me about the city is there's a lot of magical thinking that goes on here. We do concretize and reify what goes on here. We do imagine that it is the only way. And it is a choice and it is an illusion and it is magical thinking. And it is possible to broach that subject in the corridors of power and the boardrooms. And it is possible for people to ask clients at the very least, what is your role in this transition, this now or never moment? Certainly firms, it is, I think, absolutely right. And it may well be happening for firms, for their staff to ask them, what clients are we choosing? Are we? advising the Wagner Group? Are we advising uh, people who are perpetuating this crisis? Or what is our role? And I think the simple act of coming to this room and joining Lawyers Against Poverty and listening to Philippe and participating in the debate is at fundamental importance and hugely significant. So just being here, it, is, it matters. So I'd leave you with the thought return you to the, the person, the young person you imagined when we uh, began. And when you leave here and you get on the bus or the tube, um, or tomorrow as you walk into the office, I would invite you to just do one small thing, one small thing that is an act, your act of power, defiance, whatever it is, that will help achieve a fair, world for them, a future that they can grow up in. Um, because I think we're all Chagossians now. And why don't we go and have a drink? Right, just falls to me to, uh, to thank everybody. Um, what a wonderful evening it's been. Really magical, amazing um, evening. Thank you very much, all of you, for being part of it. Um, so um, my name is Richard Dighton. I'm co-chair with Kirsty of Lawyers Against Poverty. Um, thank you very much. Massive thanks to our speakers, to Joss, to Philippe and to Nick tonight. Um, I hope that you have been inspired, as I have, um, by the things and the stories that you've been uh, hearing from them. Um, I think we can all make a difference as a profession um, to the crisis that we have, particularly environmental one and human one that we're now in. Um, so that leads a nice segue for me uh, to um, appeal to you for Lawyers Against Poverty, because um, we have a good deal of members. We have 150 members and we have 600 uh, junior LAP members, um, but we need many, many more. So I'm really asking you and pleading with you to actually join us at LAP. Um, speak to our wonderful executive director, Emma, um, uh, who's actually put all this conference together for you tonight, um, or, or any of the board members. Um, an evening like this wouldn't be uh, an evening without um, some refreshments at the end and um, I really want to thank uh, JP in particular and for Latham and Watkins in hosting us tonight. Thank you, JP. Thank you.